Welcome to the second lecture. I will uh, continue where I uh, uh, picked up. So as you see, I already got uh, started. Uh, I'm going to show some formulas and some computations. So I have written here on the blackboard the uh, things that we need to uh, remember. So we have this uh, hypersurface gamma. Uh, it lies in a manifold of dimension n plus 1. Uh, the comparison formula I'm going to mention actually works on any Riemannian manifold. So uh, for now, I'm not going to assume that it's even a cartan hadamard space. And, uh, well, we have a uh, shape operator that acts on the tangent space. It's a linear <laughs> operator on the tangent space of gamma at uh, each point, and it's uh, to each vector, it assigns the derivative of the normal in that uh, direction. So this is the uh, covariant derivative of uh, manifold M. The eigenvalues of the shape operator are the so-called principal curvatures. So we obtain N minus, uh, uh, Sorry, actually, I'll see now. I see now that I set my my dimension is not uh, consistent with the uh, slides. This should be uh, uh, n minus one to be consistent with the slides. Okay, so uh, right. So this is right. So it has n minus one eigenvalues, and as uh, Andreas was mentioning earlier, we look at the symmetric polynomials of the eigenvalues. So the symmetric polynomials uh, range from the trace, which is the sum of all the eigenvalues, that gives you the mean curvature, uh, to the determinant. So the determinant will be the product of all these guys, which is the so-called gauss kronecker curvature. And uh, you integrate that, and you get the total arc mean curvature. So if this is a convex body in Euclidean space, these are sometimes known as uh, thermos uh, integrals. Or sometimes they're called uh, intrinsic volumes. These are the coefficients, as Andreas mentioned, of a Steiner polynomial. So if you get the convex body and you go out by distance of uh, t, you obtain a polynomial uh, in t. For the volume, it will have uh, power n. For the surface area, it will have power n minus 1. So these are important quantities because they tell you what is the first, second, third variation of the volume or surface area of your uh, surface under this uh, parallel uh, deformation. So, uh, it's obvious that they play an important role, as they do, in, uh, for instance, isoparametric inequality, which is the uh, main motivation for these whole uh, talks. Uh, how to prove the isoparametric inequality in cartan hadamard manifolds, and as I discussed last time, if one can uh, establish some associated inequalities for the total gas Kronecker curvature or the total mean curvature, then these inequalities will imply the isoparametric inequality. So uh, to answer that question or to make progress towards it, uh, a basic question is how do these uh, coefficients, how do these uh, intrinsic volumes or total mean curvatures change? So a basic formula that I'm going to derive here uh, is that if we have a pair of nested uh, hypersurfaces, so I have some closed hypersurface uh, gamma, and there is a smaller one contained uh, inside. So, and then the, uh, the notation I'm using is that, uh, so here, this is a domain omega, let's say this is a domain D, and the notation which is uh, used in my paper with uh, Joel Sprock and in his notes, is that then this annular domain is omega minus d, okay? So this is the setup, uh, and we like to uh, answer this question. 
what is the difference between the total uh, generalized mean curvatures. So, so the way uh, we're going to uh, do this computation is that uh, we're going to think of a big gamma and little gamma as the level sets of a function, a uh, C11 function. So it's one times continuously differentiable, and the second derivative is Lipschitz continuous. So it means that uh, this function is uh, twice differentiable at every point, and its second derivatives are integrable by Rademacher's theorem. Uh, and we assume that the gradient of this function uh, doesn't vanish, which means that all its level sets are uh, C11. And uh, its level sets include the uh, big gamma and the uh, little gamma. And uh, this kappa u, this indicates the principal curvatures of the level sets. Uh, e, E1 to EN, EN minus one, indicate the corresponding principal directions. So principal curvatures are the eigenvalues of the shape operator. Principal directions will be the corresponding eigenvectors. And uh, the nth one, the nth one is just the uh, normal, which is uh, the gradient of uh, u. And uh, so then we can, this is the Riemann curvature tensor with respect to the uh, <clears throat> principal directions that uh, we have. And once I can uh, define the Riemann curvature tensor, then we can also define the uh, sectional curvatures uh, accordingly. So the sectional curvatures, Aij, these are R, Ij, Ij. So these are the quantities that have geometric uh, meaning. Uh, Riemann himself actually had a very uh, simple conception of where these come from. He took uh, Gij, the coefficients of uh, metric and normal coordinates, and he took the Taylor series of that. In normal coordinates, the first terms in Taylor series vanish, and the second terms are exactly these quantities. But uh, these quantities have uh, geometric meaning only when these uh, coefficients repeat, i, j, i, j. Uh, otherwise, uh, they don't really mean anything geometrically. Uh, when the coefficients repeat, uh, what we obtain is the curvature of a surface in the manifold, which is generated by the two vectors E1 and Ej. So these two vectors generate a plane in the tangent space. Uh, I can take, a, take this plane, and using the exponential map, you can send it to your manifold. So one looks at all the tangent vectors in this plane, and to each tangent vector, there corresponds a geodesic in your manifold. All these geodesics, they generate a two-dimensional surface. The Gaussian curvature of that two-dimensional surface, which can be defined in terms of a triangle uh, comparison, is uh, ki, uh, kij. Okay, so, so finally, uh, I was about to write this uh, uh, comparison formula, and the comparison formula is actually uh, written here. If you let me, I was just going to um, uh, copy it. Let me just copy it here because then I'm going to stroll, but this, this comparison formula is something that uh, we will need to uh, refer to uh, constantly during the rest of the talk. So let's see, this will be the last formula I need to uh, write down. So the computation that I'm going to show you says that this is the integral over the annulus of the R plus one 
total mean curvature. So it, it has this uh, recursion happening. And then we have another integral. Will be the integral again over the annulus of uh, minus the sum of the these principal curvatures i uh, sorry, I can't eat. okay actually yes it, it's right there okay so I'm just going to <laughs> copy it in front of you guys okay so k i uh, minus one uh, u and then it gets multiplied by the sectional curvatures uh, I R N. Okay, so these are the sectional curvatures generated by the normal and one of the principal directions. These are the planes that are uh, orthogonal uh, to my surface. Uh, okay, so we have uh, this integral, and then uh, this get, uh, gets added <laughs> to one over the gradient of you. So you see, that's why we need the gradient to be. Uh, non-vanishing, uh, kappa I1, kappa I R minus two. You'll be glad I copied on the board, as I said, because once I scroll, you're going to have to uh, continuously uh, refer to it. Uh, okay, so what is this thing? This is the norm of the gradient. This indicates its derivative. Its derivative with respect to uh, this direction, and then finally, we multiply it by the uh, Riemann curvature tensor, okay? So I'm going to uh, take you through this computation and then show you why uh, it, it's worth it to uh, compute these things. It has a whole bunch of uh, applications and uh, corollaries. Uh, sorry? Oh, N. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. I need four indices. That's right. Uh, IR, my, IR, IR minus one, IR, and N. So this also always include the normal, uh, normal direction. Uh, this is, uh, so the reason the topology is going to be trivial is because of, uh, it's here, because we're assuming that the gradient is uh, not zero. So, uh, so well, yes, so, so these two hypersurfaces, they will be isotopic to each other. Yes, so th that assumption is important. Uh, these are compact. Uh, these are all the assumptions I need. I have a C11 function with uh, non-zero uh, gradient, and these are its level sets. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so now before I start uh, scrolling, let me also explain. So, so the first term is fine. Right? I mean, why should one complain about that? It's a very nice uh, recursive thing that happens. Uh, this here, it looks like a kind of a big mess, but actually there is not much to complain about the first integral. Actually, the first integral is very nice uh, because ultimately we're going to apply this formula in the situations where the big gamma and little gamma are convex. So if these are convex, it means that all the principal curvatures are positive, okay? And uh, we're going to apply it in the context of cartan hadamard So in a cartan hadamard manifold, the sectional curvature is going to be negative. But then I have a negative sign in front. So this first integral uh, is nice because I know it's always positive, right? The whole idea is uh, to know what the sign is of the right-hand side. So the first integral will always be positive, which is uh, excellent. Now. Over here though, okay, so I have these principal curvatures. I know what the signs of these guys are, so that's very good. Now, then 
it gets multiplied by the derivative of the norm of gradient. So this, this is already not so nice because it's not clear uh, what the sign of this guy is. But to make the matters worse, it gets multiplied by the Riemann tensor. Now, as I said, a Riemann tensor is nothing to be afraid of when the indices repeat. When the indices repeat, it's a section of curvature. It's a geometric quantity, and we understand what it is. But when you have the so-called mixed terms, uh, you have no idea what's going on. Yes? Yes, it, it's one dimension higher, yes. Yeah, curvatures of the level sets. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, right. So, these are called the uh, mixed terms. Uh, yeah, they completely mix, mix, make, make a complete mess because uh, we don't know what their sign is. Even in a carton hadamard manifold, even, uh, so carton hadamard manifold means that the sectional curvatures are non-positive. So the uh, K, I, J, these are non-positive. But the mixed terms, they can have any sign they want. They can be positive, they can be negative, maybe some of them are even zero. There is no control that we can apply to those guys. So this is a major obstacle in understanding higher dimensional uh, Riemannian uh, geometry. Okay, so we have our formula written. And uh, so now we're going to, uh, I'm going to show you how, how it's computed and also uh, give you some examples to let us uh, digest it and I also then discuss its uh, applications. So uh, a, a nice place to start uh, digesting this huge formula is uh, when, uh, when you said, uh, in the simplest case, so when you said r equal to zero, when you said uh, r equal to zero, uh, the right-hand side just becomes integral of the mean, mean curvature, uh, trace of the shape operator. But this is, it's well known that the mean curvature is just the divergence of the unit normal. So, uh, so what's the integral of that? By the Stokes theorem, it's the flux of the unit normal over the boundary surfaces, but the unit normals are orthogonal. So you just get the area. So th this formula is well known uh, to people who uh, study uh, minimal surfaces or surfaces of uh, constant mean curvature. So uh, this big integral, uh, I guess the simplest way you can think about it is just a big uh, generalization of this uh, well-known thing. Okay, so let me, there, there are a couple of ways to prove it. In, the first, in my first paper with uh, Joel Sprock, uh, we use these, uh, so-called Newton operators, which a name given by mathematician Riley. He wrote a couple of papers on invariance of Hessians, on functions, on manifold, which turn out to have so many different kinds of applications. So I'm going to go through this quickly, but actually the proof I'm going to present is using the differential forms in the style of churn. I think that, that proof is kind of easier to understand than this one. Nevertheless, let me quickly go through this. So we're going to take the Hessian uh, view, this function, and then uh, we're going to form this uh, characteristic uh, polynomial of the Hessian. So you can take that uh, polynomial and uh, truncate, that is, remove the terms of order higher than r. What remains is called Newton operator. As I said, this is the name that Riley gave it. I'm not sure 
what this actually had with uh, Newton, nevertheless, that's what they called it. And so in terms of the Newton operator, this uh, generalized mean curvatures actually can satisfy this formula. So they satisfy this formula, and then there is a divergence identity, which is proved in the paper, uh, which is there, that, uh, so you can think of these Newton operators as matrices. So you, you multiply it by that normal, that's another matrix. Divergence of a matrix is a divergence of each of its columns. So the left-hand side will be a vector. And, uh, or, uh, yeah, the divergence of each of its columns. No, no, so that's right. So you multiply that vector by TR, you get another vector. So the, then the divergence of that is a number, and on the right-hand side you have a, a number. So you, you plug this identity in the Stokes formula, and you get uh, this. I mean, obviously, Stokes formula has to have something, right? Whenever, uh, any place in math, you have some inequality which relates some quantity in a domain to quantity on the boundary. Uh, Stokes theorem is the usual suspect, and this is the case here. But, you know, this is kind of a weird uh, identity. A, a more systematic way that one can actually prove this is uh, using these uh, differential forms uh, in the style of uh, churn. So we want to define an n minus one form so that if you act on that n minus one form, uh, if you take that n minus one form and act on it, on the principal directions, you get the rth mean curvature. Suppose that this differential form uh, can be defined. Uh, in fact, uh, it turns out that it can be defined. So this differential form that I've written has exactly that uh, property. So, but uh, you know, let me just say, before I show you the computation, let me just say, uh, uh, where are we going with this? So, uh, proof of the, you know, let me just tell you the main idea. So, proof of the comparison formula via differential forms. I mean, the, the great things about this is that even though computation is going to be uh, intensive, but you know, the, the basic idea is very simple. So, uh, all you need is find and uh, n minus one form uh, p sub r such that what? Such that the rth mean curvature is the integral of that over your surface. Then the Stokes theorem takes care of everything else. mr of gamma minus mr of uh, little gamma so this is the integral over the boundary of our uh, domain of phi r. So the rest of it is the Stokes theorem. Stokes theorem tells us that this is exactly integral over the domain of the phi r. So once you figure out what differential, what that differential form is, then uh, we have to compute its uh, exterior uh, derivative. And this has a standard procedure. So these guys, theta i, these are the dual one forms of the principal directions. So they're either a one or zero, depending on whether the indices match or not. These are also standard objects. These are called the connection one forms. So this goes back to Cartan. If you have a moving frame in a manifold, which is given by my principal direction and the normal vector, then uh, you can take the covariant derivative of these with respect to some direction and dot it with the other ones, and we obtain these connection one forms. So these are the, the two basic ingredients of uh, Cartan's method of moving frames. And uh, so this differential form then, as you see, it's uh, composed by combining these two objects. And uh, Cartan tells us exactly 
what the differential of all these guys are. And there, is, there are standard formulas. If you want to compute the differential of the wedge of uh, one forms, we know how that's to be done. Now, the nice property of these is that uh, if you act on the principal directions, uh, you obtain the corresponding principal curvatures, right? So this is the Stokes theorem. And then, uh, then you compute. You compute, and this is what you get. And uh, I'm not ashamed to admit uh, that, OK, so this computation like, took me like uh, two, three weeks. And, I don't <laughs> and using the fact that I already knew what the answer is, I knew what the answer was, so still it, it took me <laughs> a, uh, two or three weeks. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and then one week was just spent on getting the sign correct. Minus one to the n minus one. <laughs> Plus minus one to the r minus one. So an entire week every day was trying to figure out why the sun wasn't working. Uh, so when you do this computation, then the so-called curvature two forms, uh, they uh, pop out by the uh, Cartan's uh, equations. And so these are the two forms which correspond to the uh, curvature operator r. So r is the... Uh, uh, curvature operator, uh, I just uh, write it here. So this is uh, delta x, uh, delta y of c, the famous formula. I think probably everybody here uh, has seen them before. And uh, so these are the uh, forms that correspond to that. And then, uh, but you know, a complicating factor is that I have also the normal direction. So in the normal direction, uh, when you uh, apply the corresponding form to that, uh, we get this term. And uh, this term is where uh, this term comes from. OK, so, so thank you for being so patient, putting up with this computation. But now that the computation is done, now we can uh, reap, uh, reap the benefit and look at uh, some applications that it has. OK, so, so this, this is the good term here, because I know exactly what its sign is for convex hypersurfaces in a cartan hadron manifold. This term is, is really hopeless. I mean, if somebody could explain how one can control the sign of this, uh, that would be wonderful. But I don't think there is any way. So the only way to deal with this term is to, uh, to kill it. Look at the situations where this term is zero, OK? And this term is going to be zero in certain situations. Well, it's going to be zero when the gradient has constant norm. And that's not such a crazy property. For the distance function, the gradient is going to have constant norm. So the gradient, if u is the distance function, then these uh, level sets, level hypersurfaces are parallel to each other which is, of course, an important situation. So in that case, uh, this vanishes. There is uh, another situation where this, this vanishes. Uh, Riemann himself, in his habitation lecture, he computed only curvature of spaces of constant curvature. Uh, one reason was that in a space of constant curvature, the mixed terms, they drop out. So if I'm in a space of constant curvature, like a hyperbolic space, for instance, this term drops out. So that's the uh, second case where everything works nice. And there is a third case. Uh, if r is 1, notice that these coefficients go to r minus 2. So if r is 1, there is not enough of them to go around. Then this term uh, vanishes again. Yes? Uh, uh, my, my coordinate system is fixed. My coordinate system are the ones that are corresponding to the principal uh, directions and the normal. This is the coordinate system that uh, I have.
Oh, I see. It could be interesting. Thank you. Uh, yes. Okay. So, so in these cases, uh, this bad term drops out, and we can get several new uh, inequalities. So now let's switch the case when M is a carton Hadamard manifold. So uh, these guys are going to be non-positive. And also we have convex hypersurfaces. So the principal curvatures are also positive. So this, this guy is going to have a positive sign. And then uh, we're going to get some uh, nice applications. So monotonicity formula for the total mean curvature. So remember, one big problem in a carton hardware manifold was that there is no monotonicity for the gauss kornecker curvature, for the determinant. Uh, Dexter gave uh, counterexamples of that. But for the trace of the shape operator, you have uh, monotonicity. Uh, it just pops right out when we put uh, r equals uh, 1. And actually, in that case, uh, here, these guys get some. The, the sum of the sectional curvatures when you keep the n fixed and then you range over the normal directions gives us the Ricci curvature. And uh, one side result of that is that if k, k is bounded above by this negative constant a, uh, we get that inequality. So it's a lower bound for uh, mean curvature in terms of the volume of the domain that it bounds. And actually, it turns out that this is a sharp inequality for n equals 3 and uh, generalizes what uh, Gallego and Solanes had proved in the three-dimensional hyperbolic space. So it actually generalizes now to any uh, carton hardware manifold when the dimension n is uh, equal three. Then we get monotonicity for parallel surfaces, and so this is important. So if gamma and big gamma and little gamma are parallel surfaces, which means that if uh, u was the distance, let's say, from big gamma. So there are level sets of the distance function. The distance function, the norm of its gradient is 1. So the derivative vanishes. And then uh, when you subtract, the right-hand side will be bigger than or equal to 0. So this means that in any carton hadron manifold, if you start with a convex surface and you go inside by some constant distance, then the rth mean curvature will be decreasing. And uh, so this is important because, as uh, uh, Andreas was mentioning earlier, sometimes uh, the convex object that we have is uh, singular. But uh, the distance function from a convex set in a carton hardware manifold is always a convex function. And it's uh, C11. So it's level sets, it's outer parallel surfaces. These guys are always C11. So the outer parallel surfaces, for them, you can always compute the arc mean curvature. And then you take the limit as uh, epsilon uh, goes to 0. So this allows you to define the total mean curvatures for singular objects. Uh, uh, okay, so it's decreasing and it's not negative, so you know the limit exists. Uh, unfortunately, I still cannot show, despite that, that the total gas conquer curvature of a convex set in a carton hadron manifold has to be positive. So why does this, why is the limit not zero? I still do not know that. Uh, okay, and then another application is uh, rigidity theorem for uh, curvature. So the rigidity, which is in the uh, title of the conference, this is the rigidity theorem. Uh, if uh, we have a strictly convex hypersurface, so a strictly convex hypersurface means that the principal curvatures are all positive. 
if you have a strictly convex hypersurface in a cotton hardwell manifold, so the curvature is bounded above by A, some uh, non-positive constant. And uh, furthermore, you assume that the sectional curvature is constant on the tangent planes of uh, gamma. So how much time do I have? Uh, until four, is it? Until four, thank you. Uh, yes, so, uh, right, so I have this strictly convex hypersurface uh, in this space with curvature bounded uh, above by A, and the, suppose that the curvature achieves its maximum value on tangent planes of gamma. Then uh, we conclude based on that that the curvature is constant. So this is, uh, this is a nice result, and uh, uh, it refines... Uh, Theorems observed earlier by starting with Gromov and Green and Wu, and later even extended further. Of course, uh, these theorems are uh, in n dimensions. This application here only works in dimension three, due to some, uh, you know, the situation with this formula. In the lectures three and four that I'm going to give, we're going to use the techniques from cat k spaces to actually prove this uh, result in uh, n dimensions. So this was based on ideas of uh, Petrona. So this will be for the Thursday and Friday. But today, I will show you how this follows from the uh, comparison formula. And so, so this generalizes this earlier uh, result that, as I said, uh, was first observed by Gromov and uh, Green and Wu. So if, if we have M, which is a C, Carton Hadamard manifold. So the, the curvature M is bounded above by A less than or equal to zero. And suppose that you have some compact set here. And in the complement of the compact set, the curvature is A. Then the curvature is going to be A everywhere. So for instance, if you have a Carton Hadamard manifold and the curvature is zero outside the compact set, then the Carton Hadamard manifold must be the Euclidean space. So this theorem generalizes that, because if you have a compact set, uh, you can always enclose it in a uh, sphere, okay? And so you let the gamma to be the sphere enclosing that uh, compact set. Okay, so what is the proof? Actually, I updated the, the notes on my website. Uh, has a kind of a different argument. So actually, I already updated that too match the paper with uh, one of the papers that followed from my first paper with Joe Sprott. So, so the idea is that uh, start with gamma and let gamma epsilon just be the parallel surface at distance epsilon. Then uh, the comparison formula reduces to that. So we have the, so these are two cases. The first case are meant to be the little case. We have the principal curvatures of the level sets. So the level sets are now uh, this parameter t. So t varies from zero to epsilon. So we get that quantity, but the sectional curvatures are by assumption less than or equal to uh, a. So minus of that will be bigger than uh, minus a. So we obtain uh, this inequality. And then remember, so this is now just a trace of the shape operator, which remember is the mean curvature of the level set at t, which is just the divergence of the distance function. So you apply the Stokes theorem. We get this quantity. So uh, this quantity is going to be positive. Uh, in a carton hadron manifold, area decreases because the projection to any convex set is uh, distance uh, decreasing. Now, uh, we have the Gauss's equation in any manifold if, uh, well, it, this is a Let's look at the three-dimensional case. So I have a surface in a carton hadron manifold. Its gauss kornecker curvature is equal to its uh, sectional curvature minus the sectional curvature of the ambient space evaluated on the tangent plane. So if we are on the Euclidean space, uh, this term will be zero, right? And what, what remains is Gauss's theorema egregium, that the intrinsic and extrinsic curvatures are the same. A Gauss's equation is a generalization of that. You get the third term if you're not in the Euclidean space. So uh, using the Gauss's equation, we can uh, compute 
the, uh, so these are the total gas Kronecker curvatures. We compute the total gas Kronecker curvatures of uh, gamma and uh, gamma epsilon. Uh, this term is going to go to four pi by gauss bonnet okay? So this is, uh, again, so this is why I'm assuming that the dimension is three, because uh, no gauss bonnet in uh, higher dimensions. Uh, well, I might, uh, well, so that's right. So, you know, churn gauss bonnet uh, churn extended this gauss bonnet theorem to higher dimensions, but uh, uh, there's a big problem with it. You know what the big problem is with the churn gauss bonnet The mixed curvature term. The mixed curvature terms uh, pop in and basically ruin the whole thing. Uh, so, uh, okay, so, so we integrate, so this goes to four pi, and on, on the right-hand side I have this, but I know that these are uh, bounded above by A, so I get this thing here. And for uh, M2 gamma, again, I, I get uh, the same thing. So uh, these two equations, if I put them together, uh, I, I can subtract. So I, I subtract. I get this uh, inequality. Uh, so, so this is the opposite of the inequality that we had earlier, right? So up here, I had it's bigger than this quantity, right? Right, so up, up here we started, this was bigger than this quantity, but then you can also get the reverse, uh, reverse inequality, which means that the equality must hold. So this is actually exactly equal uh, to the right-hand side. Once the equality holds, then uh, it follows that uh, these uh, sectional curvatures are constant on A, and also equality must hold in here, which means that uh, these curvatures are also constant. So the curvatures will be constant on three mutually orthogonal planes, and that uh, because the curvature is bounded above by A and is constant on three mutually orthogonal planes, it's going to, uh, you're going to get from that that it's actually is constant on the entire annulus. So because the curvature is constant on the uh, annulus, it means that the annulus can be locally isometrically uh, embedded in the hyperbolic space of constant curvature A. But the annulus is simply connected. So if you can locally isometrically embed it, you can globally uh, isometrically embed it. And uh, because uh, these guys have a positive principal curvatures, when you embed it here, these guys are going to have positive principal curvatures. So actually, the image is going to be, again, a convex annulus. So in this space, uh, you can take the complement of the annulus. So it, it has, its complement has this smaller region, not this region. Take the big region. And you take the big region and you glue it to gamma, okay? Using your isometric embedding function. So when you do that, you obtain a carton hadamard space with which property? With a curvature constant outside the compact set. So by uh, green wool gromov theorem, it means that the curvature is uh, constant everywhere, which concludes the proof. OK, so the last part involves this uh, global isometric embedding and uh, appealing to the original gas green wood theorem. But uh, the proof I'm going to give Thursday or Friday for the higher dimensional version of this result actually gives a new proof of the Grom of uh, uh, green wood theorem. It doesn't just uh, reduce it to their argument. OK, so. Uh, so since uh, I have uh, a few minutes, uh, let me throw in uh, another result. Uh, one thing that I mentioned uh, in the plan of the talks was that the uh, harmonic mean curvature flow was also uh, important in this whole circle of uh, problems and uh, results. So, um, you know, I, of course, you know, curvature flows are so useful uh, in geometry. And in Euclidean space, we have the mean curvature flow. So, so what is that? So if you have a surface and uh, you look at uh, its normal, let's, uh, let's look at the in inward normal. 
and uh, you move the surface in the direction of the normal according to the magnitude of the mean curvature. So it's, it's a famous theorem that uh, then this it will evolve through a sequence of uh, nested hypersurfaces and they become circular in the limit and various quantities evolve monotonically. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Unfortunately, it doesn't work out in a uh, cartan hadamard manifold. In the cartan hadamard manifold, the curvature flow is not by the sum of the principal curvatures, but it's by their harmonic mean somehow. If you flow according to the harmonic mean, again, convexity is going to be preserved and your object is going to become round in the limit. So using that, one can uh, generalize this Minkowski inequality. So I mentioned this in the last talk. So Minkowski showed that if you have a closed, uh, if you have a convex surface and you in space, then the total mean curvature is bounded below by the square root of uh, 16 pi times area of gamma. So we can uh, generalize that by throwing this other term here, minus 2a times uh, area of gamma squared, uh, where a is the uh, non-positive upper bound for the curvature of the uh, space. Uh, so Gallego-Salonis, remember I showed this pancake example that beats the sphere? Uh, in the pancake examples, there's like a one parameter family of pancakes that one can compute. The best constant that one gets there is uh, pi squared over four, which is a 2.47. So if the optimal inequality is of this form, I don't know if that inequality is sharp, but if the optimal inequality is, is of this form, then that thing that we have there is not far from optimal. Whatever this uh, constant is should be between two and uh, 2.47. Now this is proved <laughs> by the harmonic mean curvature flow. Okay, that's the last thing I'm going to mention. So if you have a hypersurface, we generate a family of hypersurfaces at time t, and these are given by derivative at time t equal to some speed function f times the norm, times the direction of the, of the normal, and the speed is the harmonic uh, mean. So you take the harmonic mean of a bunch of numbers is that you take the reciprocal of them, you add them, and you take the reciprocal of that. So for some reason that I have uh, no clue, the harmonic mean will uh, preserve the convexity in a carton hardware manifold and shrink it while preserving convexity to a, uh, a round surface. And actually, uh, one of the people who uh, studies this, and I mentioned uh, in my first talk, I didn't know at the time uh, who was actually uh, in the audience. And uh, together with uh, Andrews and other authors, they have uh, been studying that. But uh, it seems that nobody has an intuitive reason why the harmonic mean works. So it just works. So uh, OK, so we have this. Uh, so you ha we have the harmonic mean. And there is this quantity that I want to uh, understand. So this quantity at time t uh, corresponds uh, to this function here, p of t. I squared the right-hand side, and I took the uh, stuff to the left-hand side. So we need to control this quantity. So the way we're going to co uh, control it by computing its derivative. Its derivative can be computed using various uh, standard formulas. Uh, OK? My time is running out, so, but long story short, you can compute the derivative, and the point is that, uh, and you use the gauss bonnet theorem, the point is that uh, the derivative is negative, which means that uh, we have monotonicity. And in the limit, we get the round sphere, where I know that uh, this inequality that I want to show for the uh, mean curvature holds. So, this evolution has this uh, very nice monotonicity property, and it gives me the, uh, the exact uh, formula that I want. This formula can also be improved when we have a hollow convex, which is uh, through each point of the hypersurface there passes a hollow sphere, which uh, supports. Uh, so I see my time is up. I'm sorry, I also went a couple minutes uh, over time. So thank you. Thank you very much.